I want to thank JP and the rest of the J Pulse team for inviting me here tonight. It's very exciting to be with you here just a few days before Hanukkah. I want to begin our talk about Hanukkah tonight by telling you three stories uh, that will be familiar to you, uh, and you may not realize how incredibly connected they are. The Torah has a story that it tells uh, in the beginning of the book of Numbers, where it describes that, at the, that when the tabernacle was constructed, when the Mishkan was built, so they celebrated the building of the Mishkan for several days, and then after they celebrated it, so they began to uh, offer sort of inauguration sacrifices. You know, like everything, they, they had a big celebration, and they began to use it for its purpose. So the Torah details how for the first 12 days, all of the governors, the princes, the presidents of the particular tribes, they each offered a, a big offering on each day. On the first day, it was the head of the tribe of Judah. On the second day, it was the head of the tribe of Yisachar. And then they continue on to list all 12 tribes. The next thing the Torah tells, after it lists these 12 tribes and the 12 stories of their 12 offerings, the next thing it tells is that Aaron, Aaron the high priest, was commanded by God to light the menorah. So the rabbis of the Talmud, the rabbis of the Midrash, recognize a connection between these two episodes, the episode of the 12 days of inauguration offerings by the 12 princes, and the story of Aaron, of Aaron Akoin, who brought, who was commanded to light the, the, light the menorah, light the candles, the candelabrum, inside of the tabernacle. And the rabbis say, why were these two things juxtaposed to each other? The answer is because Aaron actually was very despondent. You know, one of the funny things about the Jewish tradition is that we talk about the 12 tribes, but there's really 13. You know about that? That we talk about, there are 12 sons of, of Jacob, but we split the, son, the, the tribe of Joseph into two, into the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. And so really, there's 13. And when we talk about the 12 tribes generally, we're talking about the 12 besides the tribe of Levi, the priestly caste. So the tribe of Levi was not included in the, in the 12 inauguration days of offerings. And Aaron was very sad about this. Aaron wondered how it could be that he was excluded. He, the high priest, was excluded from the inauguration offerings that were brought on the first 12 days. He was the president, the prince, the governor of the, of the tribe of Levi, and he wanted to be involved, says the Midrash, and he was sad about it. So God said to him, Aaron, you have nothing to be sad about. He said, don't worry. Your share is greater than their share because your share is to light the menorah. Your share is to light the menorah. And therefore, he was commanded to light the menorah on a daily basis. Nice story, but it's a story that has some problems. And the Ramban, famous commentary on the Chumash, on the Torah, who lived in the 13th century, he has the following difficulty. He says, I don't understand. What kind of consolation is that? So he wasn't involved in the inauguration, but, but, therefore, but then he was told, but don't worry, you, you get to light the menorah every day? It's a non sequitur. He wanted to be part of the inauguration. He wanted to be involved with sacrifices. God says, don't worry about sacrifices. You can light the menorah. What's better about the menorah than the sacrifices? In fact, he says, there's all kinds of things that, Aaron's got, that, all kinds of things that Aaron got to do every day. So why say, why, what's so special about the menorah? So the Ramban, Nachmanides, writing in the 13th century, he says the following unbelievable thing. He says, you know what's so special about the menorah? He says, Jewish history, Jewish history is what's special about the menorah because the menorah has more lasting power than the rest of the sacrificial rite, than the rest of the temple rite. Because the korbanot, the sacrifices, they are offered in the time of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. They were offered in the time of the first temple and in the time of the second temple. But then when we, when we unfortunately don't have a temple, there are no sacrifices. Even the incense, which is the holiest thing that Aaron, would, 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 that Aaron was selected to bring every day, the ketorah, the incense offering, that also only exists when there's a tabernacle or a temple. So when the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, when the Mishkan was destroyed, there was no... There was no Sacrifices, and there, there were no sacrifices, and there was no incense. There was no ketoret. Says the Ramban, what's so special about the menorah? It's not just the menorah, he says, of the Mishkan. It's referring to another menorah. It's telling Aaron, Aaron, don't worry, God says. Your share is greater than theirs. You know why your share is greater than theirs? Because they'll be involved with sacrifices. But you'll be involved with the menorah today, and that menorah will stay lit in the exile. That's the menorah, he says, of the Chashmonaim of the Maccabees, the menorah that they will relight in the temple when they rededicate the temple, taking it over from the, from the Syrian Greeks. 
they will re relight the menorah, and Jews in every generation will continue to light the menorah. For thousands of years after the temple is destroyed, for thousands of years when there's no temple, there will be a menorah. So says the Ramban. So that's what's so great about the menorah. The menorah has, has staying power. Okay, that's the first story. The story that Aaron, when he lit the menorah in the Mishkan, he was lighting the menorah that we're going to light this Saturday night and for, ni and for seven days that follow. I want to tell you a second story. The second story is about Hanukkah. A long time ago, over 2,000 years ago, there was a enemy power that, that, that controlled the Jewish homeland, that controlled Israel. We, t we tend to call them the Greeks. Those who know history know that it was really the uh, Seleucids, uh, or something like that, Sel Seleucid, I think is, is how you pronounce them. These were, these were Assyrians who were part of the uh, division of the Greek Empire after the time of Alexander, and they controlled the land of Israel. They were led by, by, a, by a king called Antiochus, and Antiochus, he created a series of enactments against the Jewish people trying to convince, or try, trying his best to get the Jews to leave conventional practice and to incorporate Hellenistic ideals into their lives. He created a whole series of, of uh, restrictions, various Jewish sources tell us. Some of them were not to observe Shabbat, not to observe the holiday of Rosh Chodesh, various religious observances against bris milah, against giving a bris. But there were even more unusual things. Some sources indicate that he commanded that the Jewish people have the doors removed from their homes, and that he commanded the Jewish people that every young bride first live with the local governor first go to the palace before she goes to her uh, bridal home and be defiled in that way. And he had a most unusual enactment that he said that he demanded that the Jewish people engrave and inscribe on the horns of the oxen the phrase, Ein lanu chilek belokei Yisrael, we have no share in the God of Israel. A most unusual practice. And the story is told about Hanukkah, that on Hanukkah, thank God, the Talmud describes that after a certain amount of time, we, were, we, we waged war with the, with the evil king Antiochus. We waged war, unfortunately, with our brethren. And we were able to recapture the Holy Temple. And we were able to reconsecrate the Holy Temple. And we were able to relight that menorah, the same menorah that Aaron had lit. Not the same one physically, but the same one spiritually. We were able to redo that. And when we were able to redo that, we were fortunately... Uh, we were able to enact not only a return to the Jewish religion, but we enacted the holiday of Hanukkah. In fact, the Talmud describes, and you're all familiar, there was a great miracle that happened. The Jews came to a defiled temple, and in the defiled temple, they found only one flask of oil. And that one flask of oil should have burnt for only one day. But instead, they lit it, and it burned for eight, and it burned for eight days. It burned for eight days, and in the coming years, the rabbis established a holiday in celebration of the eight days. Why did, why did he make those strange enactments? What were those strange enactments to remove the door from the house, to send the young bride to the governor before going to her bridal canopy? And what, were the, and what was that ever so strange enactment to write on the, on the horns of the oxen, write on the, write on the horns of the bulls, to, that we have no share in the, in, the, in the God of Israel? So there are various explanations given, but one explanation is that the greatest attack that Antiochus had on the Jewish people with the attack on the purity of the Jewish home. He wanted to undo the Jewish home. The Jewish home, which was a fortress protecting the Jewish people from every errant influence around them, he wanted, to, he wanted to unhinge that door, open it up to not be a blockade against the outside influences. He wanted to open it up to let every, everything from outside seep in. He didn't want to protect the purity of the Jewish home. That's obviously why he wanted to defile the brides before they were with their husbands. That's obviously why he wanted to undo the special purity of the Jewish people and the special consecrated feel of their marriage relationship. And I once read in the name of, in an article written by Rabbi Yisachar Fran from Baltimore, something that he had heard, and I, I say all the names because it's so interesting to verify, something that he had heard from the late Ner Yisrael Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Kalevsky, and that Rabbi Kalevsky had heard from Rabbi Leib Gurvitz in England, that Rabbi Gurvitz was visiting the British Museum, and in the British Museum he saw that in the ancient time of the Seleucids, at that time, when in the land of Israel, there was a practice to feed babies using hollowed out horns of oxen, to use the hollowed out ox of, uh, horn of an ox as a baby bottle. And the baby bottle, that was where they wanted us to write, 
Ein lanu chilak ve'elokei Yisrael, we have no share in the Jewish, in the, in, the, in, the, in the God of Israel. Because he wanted to undo that most basic, the most basic part of the Jewish family, the wife and the husband and the little babies when they're first born, with an advertisement straight off the bat that we have no share in the, in, the, in, the, in the God of Israel. So it was against those enactments that we responded and took back the Beit HaMikdash. The third story I want to tell you is a story about today. It's a story that's going on everywhere, but we may not be paying such careful attention. The victory of the Chashmonaim, of the Maccabees, continues today. Sure, we have a Jewish people that is, for the very great majority of the Jewish people, is not observant of the Shabbat. The very great majority of the Jewish people does not have an advanced Jewish education, or even a not advanced Jewish education. The vast majority of the Jewish people are not involved with um, regular observances, and that's something from the Torah's perspective which is sad. But do you know what the number one observance of the Jewish people is? The number one observance of the Jewish people in, the, in America is the lighting of the Hanukkah candles. The 2001 National Jewish Population Survey, which was made famous in 2004, go figure, the 2001 National Jewish Population Survey, in 2004 the United Jewish Federations in America described their findings of many, many different things about the Jewish community. And one of them was, what are the most practiced mitzvot? And they found that 59% of Jews in America fast on Yom Kippur. And 67% of Jews in America observe a Passover Seder, a Pesach Seder. Again, 59 and 67. But 72% of Jews in America light Hanukkah candles. There is no observance that is more uh, widely observed than the, uh, than the observance of the lighting of the Hanukkah candles. Why, why is that? Why does that continue to be? Why is that? What's that about? We're going to discuss tonight how we light. And the Torah describes that we, the Talmud describes that we light the Hanukkah candles, that the primary mitzvah is ner ish ubeso, that every individual has an obligation, not as an individual, but as a home, to light Hanukkah candles. You know, Talmud says that no matter how many people are in your home, whether you have five people or ten people living in your home, twenty people living in your home, no matter which night it is of Hanukkah, the main obligation is to light one candle, one candle for each family. Every family shares in the obligation, like Kiddush together, like Hamotzi together, like the various things that we observe, this more than any other mitzvah. It is perhaps the only ritual mitzvah that has an obligation not on the, that does not de descend on the individual, but rather on the home. The home has to light a Hanukkah candle because the home is celebrating the Jewish home. That's what we do on Hanukkah. We're celebrating the continuity of the Jewish people, the continuity of the Jewish home. We are counteracting that which Antiochus attempted to undo. That's what we're doing on Hanukkah. But it's remarkable because this is one of the only mitzvos that the Talmud gives graded versions of its observance. The Talmud says, if you want to do it the basic way, right, like, you know, you want to sit and coach, then it says, one candle for the family. If you want to do it in an upgraded way, you want to sit in business, this is in honor of JP's mention on my travels. If you want to sit in business, says the Talmud, so there's a way to do it that we call mahadrin, that you do it in a way that you beautify it. And there the Talmud says that you light one candle for each member of the family. Okay? Instead of lighting one candle for the whole family, you light one candle for each member of the, of the household. If you have five people in the household, ten people, you light five candles, you light ten candles. And then the Talmud describes that there's another upgraded way, not a coach way and not a business class way, there's a first class way. The first class way to light Hanukkah candles, says the Talmud, is to add candles with each night. That on the first night, we light one candle, on the second night, two, on the third night, three. According to Maimonides, what that means is that if you have a family of five members, then on the first night, you light five, on the second night, you light 10, on the third night, you light 15. It continues to increase with each day that passes. That's the, obser that's the observance of the Hanukkah candles. It's called Mahadrin Min HaMahadrin. We literally, not literally perhaps, but figuratively and in a spiritual sense literally, we light the menorah of the Mishkan, Aaron's menorah, the high priest Aaron's menorah. We light that in our homes on Hanukkah. We light it, we light it each one of us as an individual. And it's interesting that 72% of the Jewish people, right, who lights the Hanukkah candles, they don't light it in, in economy. And they don't light it in business class. They all light it in first class. They all light it in this Mahadran Mina Mahadran way. So what is so special about this mitzvah? What is so unbelievable about this mitzvah that it is observed more than any other mitzvah in the highest and most upgraded form? 
those are the three stories that I wanted to open with. The story of Aaron, the story of Hanukkah in times of old, and the story of today. And if you want to learn more about how these stories impact on our observance and how we light the Hanukkah candles, and how our observance of the specific regulations of how we light the Hanukkah candles and celebrate Hanukkah, how those things impact on the rules and regulations of what we do, and how they are rooted in those stories, you'll have to watch the coming video, which, dis which has the rest of the details of this class. Thank you. Thank you.